So in this final segment, we're going to take a look at a couple mitigation methods for dealing with the high voltage versus use of smart inverter technology in the second energy storage. So for the smart inverter in OpenDSS, we've got some ability of modeling the 1547 2018 functionality. You could we could set this up in, in terms of having volt bar support through injecting bars to help control voltage. Or there's also other functionality like use of a volt watt curve where if the voltage gets too high, we can start to curtail output. In this example, what we'll do is we'll just choose a really simple droop curve for volt bar control. And what this is designed to do is to keep voltage between 0.95 and 1.05 per unit. So in this particular application, what we're going to do is if the um, voltage gets too low, then what we're going to do is we're going to push in reactive power. If the voltage gets too high, what we're going to do is we're going to basically sink reactive power. So we're going back and forth between injection and absorption mode. Now, some controllers might actually have a bandwidth uh, abandoned here where they don't do anything at all. But then for this simple example, we'll, we'll just assume we're operating linearly within this, within this range. So to do this in OpenDSS, what we need to do is we need to augment the PV site definition to include smart inverter functionality. And so what we add to our PV site definition within PV.DSS is we add this far var follow inverter equal to true. Then what we need to do is we need to define also a controller. So this controller, inverter controller is the object type. We're going to define an instance called inverter PV control one. Uh, the mode it's going to be is in volt var mode. So there's other modes, obviously. And then we're going to define a curve um, that's going to have the shape of this droop curve. And so what we do in this case is we use this new XY curve command. Uh, we have the instance called VV curve, and then we basically have these X and Y points that define this curve. So you can define a custom droop curve in this case. When you have this implemented in OpenDSS, then what this is going to do at the uh, point of interconnection, then whenever the voltage um, is going to get too high, then what we're going to do is we're going to sink sink bars. And so in this case right here, you can see what's happening in our time frame when the PV is operating. And this is showing the course of the day is that basically once the PV starts operating, we start sinking bars in order to suck that voltage back down again. And then as the P output gets higher and higher, then we have to absorb more and more bars. And you can see that it's it's, it's adjusting because as we have the cloud cover deviation, then the bar output changes accordingly. You can, this is using the, the built-in plot capability to open DSS. And one thing I don't like about this is the time scales in seconds. And so it's kind of hard to tell you know, exactly what's going on with the time scale in seconds. And, and again, this is why I suggest you use the the Excel plotting, make use of the CSV files and do the plots. Otherwise, you end up with x-axis, which are kind of hard to interpret. OK, so anyway, uh, that's what we're going to see for the, the smart inverter control. Um, if we look at the, what's going to be the impact of the point of interconnection, you can see initially with no smart inverter control that these voltages would go rather high. Um, what we see in this case that when we have the smart inverter control on by absorbing the bars, what it does is it basically pulls the voltage back down again. And so this is the way it actually would mitigate this. The, the negative side of this sort of control is if it's absorbing a lot of bars, those bars have to come from somewhere. Now, maybe they come from a local capacitor bank, or maybe those have to come from the transmission grid. If they come from the transmission grid, you know, we're, we're causing some additional issues there. So not, not a perfect solution, but, 
you know, something we could actually do. So you have to make sure you don't overuse this capability. You can also show like the regular tap changes and as a result of this, we're actually able to reduce the number of taps in this situation. So in a way, you know, if, if we had a lot of inverters out there, we may not actually need to have voltage regulators at all because if we chose our control points properly, you know, we could actually inject bars to control other voltages in the circuit. They're almost like ver variable capacitor banks. And so what some people have been looking at is, is actually the use of these inverters to do the voltage control instead of having these, these tap changes. The problem is though, would you want the inverters to be operating all the time, even when there's no sun? Uh, and then I don't know if like the, the developers of these types of systems are going to want their systems used for something like that. But anyway, this is kind of a, kind of a research area as to what degree we want to do this sort of bar control with our inverters, because it means you have to kind of oversize the inverters a little bit. Uh, you, another solution would be to use energy storage. And in this case, what we're doing is when the PV output is too high and causes the voltages to become too high, what we simply do is we just use the energy storage device to absorb um, that power, that energy at those particular times. The other thing we could do with the energy storage device would be we can try to shave peak at the top of the circuit. So what we're doing in this application, if we have the top of the circuit, we're, we're monitoring this point. If we have the PV downstream, what we could actually do is we can make our control point, this, um, this uh, power at the top of the feeder, and we could actually do what's called peak shaving um, as well. So this is probably one of the lesser mature models at OpenDSS. They haven't had energy storage model in here for that long. And so like EPRI will develop some capability it needs for projects, um, but it may not have all the functionality you would want to have. So in this case, there's a lot of different dispatch modes for this. Um, you know, you can follow a load curve, you can follow commands, you could, you could set this up for peak peak shaving, you could, you can have this thing operate on a, on a price. You know, there's a lot of different functionality for this, but what we're doing in this case is we're defining a new storage device. It's three phase. Uh, the, this is the location where this is going to be installed. Uh, this is the rating in kilowatts. Uh, this is the amount of energy. And so it's 9,600 kilowatt hours. We would call this a 9600 divided by 1200 which would be an eight hour battery uh, and this this would be the initial value of the the state of charge and so anyway what we would need to do in here is we would need to also set up a controller in this case and what we're doing in this particular case is we're charging up based on a load shape and so we're just basically charging at the peak and then what we're doing for discharge is we're, we're trying to do the peak shave at the top of the feeder right here. So we won't be using the, the storage for the project. This might be for some other project you might want to work on in the future. But what, the, what we're controlling here is we're looking at overhead one. We're looking at the top of the feeder. Um, this is the thing we're trying to shave according to. So we're trying to keep the, the KW below this value if we can. Um, there's some things you could set in here and ramp rate limits and things like this, but basically we're, we're going to try to do this peak shaving capability. And then as far as charging up, then we're just going to simply turn this on at 11 o'clock and just basically charge up the battery until we hit like 100% state of charge. And so we can define monitors in this case for the storage device for looking at state of charge and real and reactive power. Um, we could do an internal plot right here in OpenDSS. And what we see in this case is we see it charging up. Now this is per phase, not total. So it's 400 times three. But we see the battery charging up in order to reduce the, um, the voltage. And then it's also discharging in the morning. 
uh, in order to reduce the peak. And one thing you'll notice in this case, since we just simply have the, the charge on a timer, is this thing actually charges up to 100% and stops charging. Um, you probably would um, be looking at using this in, in, you know, like in the morning of the next day, maybe what you'd be doing is trying to reduce the peak even more. And, and so then if once you got everything figured out, you know, you can see like the daily du duty cycle and what you would kind of expect to see um, would probably be some other type of operation, maybe where we try to have maybe a, a deeper um, a deeper discharge, you know, like in the morning hour in order to burn up all that stored energy. So anyway, this kind of shows that with and without the battery, without the battery, you get the over voltages. And then when you have the battery charge at the, at the peak times, and basically what that does is it, it helps keep the voltages down. This is kind of an expensive solution. Um, so anyway, this shows the power at the top of the feeder. Again, this is kind of showing some per phase values in this case. And it shows that when you're discharging into the system, if you kind of mirror the shape of the, of the, the peak in this case, and what you can do is you can kind of level this down to a great extent. And then what this does is it, it kind of helps you out as far as reducing the morning peak. And this shows it has some impacts on the tap changes as well. In the future, we're probably likely going to see new PV sites combined with energy storage. Uh, there's a lot of things that energy storage can do to make large scale PV easy, easier to integrate. And so you'll see a lot of solutions where you'll have probably the, the storage integrated into the DC bus of the, in, the PV inverter. The reason you would do that is in the utility only sees one inverter interface. Uh, if you were gonna have a separate energy storage device from your PV, then when you go through the interconnection procedure, then you gotta kind of work out with the utility kind of two inverter connections instead of just one. And so this will likely be tied into the DC bus on the PV inverter. And what you would need for that then is a DC to DC link between the battery and the, and the DC bus of the inverter. Uh, there's kind of a, an interesting uh, video at a product show uh, where there's a, a little blurb from DynaPower, which is a, is a large vendor of these types of inverters. And, and actually Chris Larson used to work here on Centennial campus here at NC State a while ago when he was with ABB. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So anyway, what we're likely to see in the future um, for these projects we're gonna be evaluating is probably some combination of PV and storage. You're gonna see when you do your project part three that with just the PV by itself, we're gonna have all these issues which are hard to deal with. And so the energy storage would be one sort of solution that could be that could be married in with the, with the PV system for that. So just to kind of summarize some of the differences between using OpenDSS and Windmill. With OpenDSS, you don't really have any graphic user interface. And so it's gonna be harder to get this data into the correct format. Now, the commercial tools are starting to get this um, quasi-static modeling capability but usually it's in terms of expensive add-ons. And so a lot of utilities haven't quite bought into that, having to buy all these add-ons. Uh, and so anyway, OpenDSS kind of gives this capability to you for free, but you have to work harder to get the data into the correct format in the first place. And it's easy to make mistakes on units. And so if you didn't have that ability of exporting from Windmill, if you're trying to create the circuit from scratch, there's a good chance you're going to, you're gonna get some of the units wrong on the input. It's really hard to do. Um, the results come out in really raw format, like um, spreadsheet format. So you have to spend a lot of time reformatting that, which is a good and bad thing because you can make nicer reports, but you have to spend more time at it. 
Um, but I, I kind of like this in a way because if it comes out in Excel format to begin with, you, you can usually make nicer plots. And so once you get past the learning curve on this, you, you can kind of take advantage of its power. But if you're just getting started, um, it takes you a while to learn all this stuff. But in the end, but in the end, you get a lot more flexibility. So if if you were to really thoroughly understand OpenDSS, you know, the advantage of it, it's a tool that you could take with you anywhere. These other programs like Windmill, if you work with larger systems or Syme or Synergy, these other programs that you have to buy licenses for, if you went to work for another employer, they may not have that license. And so all the time you spent learning the tool, you know, might be kind of down the drain because your next employer might not have it. If you were going to work with OpenDSS, this is something you could always take with you, right? It's portable. And, and the neat thing about it, which we didn't even get into, is its scripting capability. And so if you're doing a spreadsheet, then you can call up a circuit model and run the circuit model and get results and things like that. So it's, it's got a lot of power if, if you know how to use it. 